gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, can I, uh, can I beg some quiet, please? <coughs> okay, well, so first up, welcome to Daunt Books. It's, uh, it's really exciting. I know you, most of you came here to see Paul Skinner, but I'm sure one or two actually came to see this marvellous 110-year-old bookshop. According to them, it is the very world's first purpose-built bookshop. Did you know that? And it kind of looks like it, doesn't it? It's a wonderful spiritual home for people like me who used to trawl into London through Maryland Station. Uh, my name is Caroline Taylor, I'm one of the members of Marketing Kind, and Paul and Anna asked me if I would kindly host this this evening, and I'm very privileged to be able to do so. Um, so uh, I hope, if you haven't already grabbed your book, there's going to be an opportunity later. Um, I hope that those of you who uh, have a chance to look at it, or read the blurbs at the beginning or on the back, um, will have a sense of what it's about. Um, I think maybe one of the reasons Paul asked me if I would come along this evening and host is because I have been obsessed for such a long time now with the idea of enlightened self-interest. And, um, and it would occur to me that all these years on, we still have far too much self-interest and not very much enlightenment, um, not least in government and as well in many businesses. So a book like Paul's is such a perfect moment, isn't it, to help people get their heads around it. Um, so I think, look, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Paul Skinner, his wonderful new book, and he's going to give us a little flavour of what's in it. Paul. Thank you, Caroline. I um, described you a few days ago as one of my true heroes, and I know that many people here feel the same way, so, so thank you for making this evening so special. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, I have to say that this is like eating all of the jelly babies in the bag at the same time. <laughs> uh, so you might have to bear with me a little bit. Um, I want to thank uh, Tom. Where's Tom and Rebecca? So Tom and Rebecca from Little Brown for making the Purpose Upgrade possible uh, before that collaborative advantage. Thank you for your generosity and energy in helping get these things over the line. Um, thank you, of course, also to um, other Rebecca uh, and the whole team at, at Daunt Books for looking after us so attentively and welcoming us into this illustrious home of great stories. I, uh, I can't tell you how many people responded to the invitation this evening uh, saying that this was their favourite bookshop. Now, um, as it happens, one of the teachers at the school I attended advised us as an experiment to take a trip to a bookshop to see which section we were naturally most drawn towards and to use that to get some kind of insight into what kind of future career we might be suited to. Now the problem in my case was that the whole bookshop was the draw, not just a single section in it. Um, but maybe that sort of foreshadowed the lifelong interest that I've had in the narratives that shape who we become, individually, through our organisations, uh, across society. Science, apparently, uh, cannot yet tell us if there is a meaning of life. But we can't help but live lives of meaning, because we map our world in meaning, um, and we use those maps to determine our journey to better. Uh, we may be less good at navigating geospatially than migratory birds, but our ability to tell stories of purpose that help us make a more imaginative journey through life, uh, I believe is our most adaptive capacity as humans. You know, it's why, unlike other species, we haven't just evolved, magnificent as evolution may be, but have also been able to develop from generation to generation in ways that have, of course, so massively accelerated the change in our lives over especially the past three human lifespans. But we do know that past performance is not a guarantee of future <laughs> success. Uh, and if we're not careful, the, problem, the solutions to yesterday's problems continue to act through us, often without us fully realising it. Uh, making us more the puppets of our prior expectations and the patterns that they gave rise to, rather than the true authors of our own future change. Or as I put it in the book, where our purpose was previously a valuable conscious lens through which to direct our actions, it can easily become a dangerous set of blinkers that can blind us to more important realities and may prevent us from taking what may be very necessary courses of action, particularly where the need for that action 
came from outside of our prior scope of reference. I remember listening to a New York City fire chief explaining a common experience amongst his firefighters when they were seeking to evacuate bars from burning buildings on a Friday night. Now, the common response wasn't the sort of knocking over bar stools in a mad dash for the exit of blind panic that you might expect, but rather, you know, the most common response was that unless the flames were already in the room that people were sitting in, a typical response was, yeah, happy to leave, but can we just finish our drinks first? <laughs> so I think this also gets to the heart of how many businesses fail, because even very successful, powerful organisations often turn out to be surprisingly fragile in the face of the psychological effects of their sunk costs. The plan continuation biases of their leaders and colleagues. And the progress traps through which the expectations and actions that gave rise to prior success also sow the seeds, the very same expectations and actions of our future failures. And of course, we know from the historians that even whole prior human civilizations have fallen when they've been unable to write a new story of purpose and bring it to bear in changing how they lived when faced, for example, with new environmental stresses. Um, I think of the ancient Sumerians who couldn't wean themselves off the agriculture that they'd grown to love when it was destroying their soils. So my interest is not just in celebrating purpose, but in recognising that even previously successful and well-intentioned purpose can go wrong, and that we may need to get much better at rewriting our stories of purpose particularly in the light of unforeseen circumstances. Now, we don't seem to be short of those. Um, during the pandemic, of course, we saw businesses repurpose their assembly lines as a short-term tactical response to produce hand sanitizer or PPE or, or even ventilators. During lockdown, we saw treasuries reverse their centuries-old tradition of collecting money to instead finding ways to distribute it directly from the Treasury. Uh, there's of course been you know, appalling news coming out of Russia in the past 24 hours, but before that, with the invasion of Ukraine, we've seen Germany uh, reverse its policy of demilitarization. We've seen Sweden and Finland abandon their neutrality. Immigration systems at least attempt to switch gear from putting the brakes on immigration to actively accelerating it. We're all experiencing a first-hand lesson in the kinds of energy that we don't want to have to depend upon, and that isn't even to seek to apprehend how people at the heart of the crisis have had to turn their lives around. In the UK, I think we've had, what, four new prime ministers in the past six years, uh, and it's perhaps not surprising in a macro environment that is so turbulent and prone to crisis that the most significant corporate turnarounds have involved purpose level change. Now, many of the organisations that people here are involved in are on journeys of change that redefine their core purpose. Now, the last email I received before walking across here was from Fika Siebesma, who is the chair and former CEO of a business that I write about um, in the book that was formerly a coal mining business that has managed to become a sustainable food business, working explicitly to fix the world's broken food system. Now, the name of that business is Royal DSM. DSM originally stood for Dutch State Mines, and the company was indeed born from digging coal, in the uh, digging coal from the ground and delivering it directly to people's homes for heating and illumination. Uh, DSM now stands informally for Do Something Meaningful, uh, and in making the transition from what was once a perfectly respectable endeavour, but which has since become problematic, uh, to becoming a true global champion of important sustainable development goals, um, and a vastly more successful business as a result, I believe that DSM stands as a powerful metaphor for the kinds of purpose upgrade that we need right across the economy as a whole. Um, and I believe that that need is only going to rise 
as incumbent business models and indeed patterns of living and working become more urgently unviable. Looking to the future, we don't really know the degree to which rising hardship will give rise to bigger thinking or to more retrenchment. We don't know to what degree the climate emergency will unlock more cooperation or just drive more conflict. We don't know to what degree further economic change will include or exclude more people from its benefits, or whether technology will be giving us a path to automated luxury or, or a highway to synchronous failure that leaves us more rather than less exposed to risk. But something we perhaps can anticipate is that as these big questions play out, they will create both rapid and extensive shifts in the priority needs of the people that we serve. And that may call us to have to call into question and rethink how we form and reform the purpose of enterprises and the activities within them to begin with. Um, and I believe that repurposing our enterprises to better meet priority human needs rather than continuing to manufacture spurious consumerist wants within existing industry conventions is now the biggest uh, business opportunity available to us, the biggest opportunity full stop available to us. Now, uh, of course, no one would pretend that that's an easy shift. Uh, in the book, I describe it as a whole new era in the evolution of enterprise adaptation. In environments of change, we learn to innovate first incrementally, then more disruptively. With the arrival of the internet and digital communications technology, we've learned not just to innovate, but to transform our businesses and other organizations and how they operate. Uh, I believe that the change we now face is so interconnected and so interdependent that we need not just to innovate and transform, but to more fundamentally repurpose our enterprises um, and the activities within them. So in the book, I seek to pull together a commentary, a call to action, and hopefully a very practical methodology that people can use to find more important problems to solve, to build solutions that enroll their stakeholders on more meaningful journeys of change, and to achieve more inclusive outcomes that reward participation in those journeys. Caroline spoke about enlightened self-interest. Uh, since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, in classical economic thinking, if we seek to derive self-directed benefits first, we're meant to end up with a collective good as the happy byproduct. I think we know that we need to raise our game. The good news, however, is that reason and evidence suggest that if we start by trying to create benefits for others, we can then derive our own self-directed rewards as our share of the far greater overall wealth of change that making our enterprises a channel for something greater than themselves can unlock. Sometimes uh, a new perspective can emerge just by asking ourselves a different set of questions. Now, what happens, for example, if instead of trying to lead the best businesses in the world for our particular industries, we try to create the best businesses for the world? Now, standing particularly here in, in Daunt Books, I'm very happy to say that I count myself a reader first and an author very much second to that. Uh, writing books alone doesn't change anything. But reading books, as part of how we read the world around us, making their ideas our own and bringing them to bear on that world can be a valuable part of how we create change. So I've written the purpose upgrade explicitly as a story that the reader or listener can complete for themselves. And my hope in writing it has been to make it a bit easier for people to make purpose a renewable resource in their own organizations, in their own lives, in the hope that we can come together with all of our stakeholders to solve on purpose a few more of the problems that we've allowed to arise 
by accident. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And that was a, well, A, I'm amazed. I mean, I know you wrote it and I know you recorded the audio book, but um, having uh, read the book and then reread it in the last few days, um, that was absolutely bang on. You didn't get a word. There's not a word he said that you won't also get reinforced when you read it. Um, I just want to say the first thing is that, I haven't read it twice now, um, it is a really slightly unusual book uh, in as much as it is both inspiring but also really practical in how you might do something about it. And I was having a walk around here earlier and of course there's a huge section of business books, 99.6% of which I have never read, um, and uh, it's about having had a long career in business. And then there's a little section up the top there that's all lit up at the moment, curiously, of self-help books. And this feels like it's a bit of both. <laughs> Um, but maybe less than self-help, more business help, um, more organisational help. But anyway, I, I highly commend it to you. It is it's really beautifully written, really easy to read, um, and, um, and really does both inspire you. By the way, Paul, I've said this to you before, but the number of examples this man provides that are not Patagonia, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not to decry Patagonia, because what they're doing is amazing and wonderful, but we all know about that, don't we? We don't need to read Paul's book to find out about that stuff, but... Um, amazing examples, and um, the, the Royal DSM one was, you know, is utterly extraordinary. Um, anyway, so all absolutely brilliant. I, I'm, I'm sure that you all will enjoy it. To which point, if you'd like a copy, you have to go and buy one. Um, and uh, and if you um, uh, if you go to the front, they will sell you one. And then if you bring it back into roughly the middle, where the lady in the glorious yellow is standing right now. Paul will be available to sign it for you, um, and uh, it'll be a first edition because, of course, we're not sure there will be more. Um, we'll update every now and then. Um, okay, so uh, there is a purpose upgrade on a whole uh, concept of selling stuff, uh, which is not a buy one get one free so much as a buy one and give one free. So when you buy it, I think when you bring it to Adana, when when they bring it to Paul for signing, do they get the little? Yeah, there's a bookmark. Okay, so you, you do need to get it signed because then you get a bookmark. And the bookmark will enable you to um, get the free copy so that you can give the one you bought to their way and get another one for yourself. How marvellous is that? Um, and it's a really great way of getting people who might not necessarily pick up a book like this. Maybe your boss, maybe one of your clients, um, maybe your children, who knows. Um, but anyway, it's a great way to do that. Um, now, some of you will have already had a drink, but there is more. Um, and I think we should, uh, we should uh, fill our glasses so that we can um, toast and celebrate uh, the wonderful success of this brilliant book and uh, exciting uh, publication day to day. Um, we are going to be uh, decamping at about 8 o'clock to the Prince Regent pub, which is, is that just the other side of Paddington Street? Have I got that right? It's... Yeah, walk up Merriman High Street that way, and then you bump into it, basically. Yeah, two blocks. Um, there's some little goodie bags here with ethical snacks in them. So on your way to the pub, if you haven't had any for supper already, then you can have some ethical snacks. Um, simply Roasted and Squirrel Sisters. I, I nearly read that as Simply Roasted Squirrels, which <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sure would not have been ethical in any way. Mind you, grey squirrels are a, are a problem, aren't they? So as long as they weren't red squirrels, it would have been all right. Yeah, okay. Simply Roasted Grey Squirrels. We should tell them. Uh, okay. Now, there is an upcoming chance for you to, once you've read the book, uh, and the person you've given a copy to has read their book too, um, to actually come and join a marketing exchange on this topic, um, um, an opportunity to discuss with Paul and sort of explore a bit further some of the thoughts in here. So that's coming up on November the 8th at 5 p.m. in London. And um, there's a, there's a smallish event, uh, which is uh, in person, live, live with real people like we are tonight. <laughs> so exciting. Um, but it will also be online like all the other marketing, uh, ex marketing kind exchanges. So, um, and I think Anna will be sending all of us the details of that so that we can join that. So that will be a great uh, next opportunity to engage with all of this. Um, but I would just like to close with saying to Paul once again, um, congratulations, Paul. It's a fabulous book. Um, and I, I do really believe it's going to make a difference. Uh, so it's on all of us to get the word out so that people can read it, because that's the problem with books. If people don't read them, they don't learn. Um, and um, with that, have a lovely drink, have a lovely chat, and uh, maybe chat to some more of you um, up at the Prince Rupert. Need to say Regent. Regent? Rupert. Prince Regent. Regent. Prince Regent. <laughs> prince, Regent. <laughs> prince Regent. Whatever. Some prince and an R word. Whatever. Um, we're all a bit done, aren't we, with all this royalty. It's come to our heads. Um, Paul Skinner, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.